As your professors may, hi, my name is Adi Gary. As your professors may have mentioned, um, about two years ago, I created the course Math 299M Visualizations in Mathematica, um, and I'm very happy that uh, Devin, Vlad, and Dan are carrying it into its fourth semester and beyond. So um, today, I want to show you some mathematical models about complex analysis. Uh, first, a little bit of my background. I'm at NYU right now in a master's program in mathematics. Uh, my thesis is in, is in computational fluid dynamics, um, and soon I'll be an inter uh, soon I'll be starting an internship at NASA in computational astrophysics. Um, so I really like visualizing things, and physics motivations uh, drive a lot of the models that I make. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, a, a quick disclaimer, the, this is a series that I've been wanting to put together for a while, and uh, hopefully in the near future I'll actually make it something like a 10-part video series on complex analysis. Um, but for now, I'm going to give you a spark notes of all the pieces and parts. Um, and it's important to remember that an important part of mathematics is thinking of things as different perspectives. So you don't necessarily need to understand every perspective of every math thing. Um, although that would give you a very robust understanding of it. Um, so as we go through these nine different models, if some of the perspectives um, suit your fancy, that's great. And if others don't sit well with you, or if you haven't seen the prerequisite uh, math to uh, understand them fully, that's okay too. This is just to get what you can out of it. Um, and if there's any particular perspective that you want to know more about, uh, I'm going to post all of these models on my website. I'll give, um, I'll give the instructors uh, the link to that so you can get to the code. And then also you could rewind this video or just email me if you wanted to know more about how a specific model works or what I was trying to uh, visualize with it. Okay, so let's get into it. So first, just some basics about complex numbers. So one interpretation of complex numbers is as points in R2. So you have R2, just the real line by the real line, just the plane, in other words, x, y pairs. Um, your x number is going to be the real part of the complex number, and your y coordinate is going to be the imaginary part of the complex number. The idea here is that the complex plane, uh, I'll double struct C, uh, here I can, I can type that. So, uh, the, so in Mathematica, uh, as I'm sure you know at this point, the escape, ds, c, escape, c, right. Okay, you can think of the complex plane as C, but with, sorry, as R2, but with some extra structure. Um, and the extra structure is that you can multiply uh, vectors together. You can multiply points together, which is something that we're going to do in the second model. But for now, let's think of complex numbers as just points. So if I move this locator around, I see I change the complex point Z at the top. If I put it on the x-axis, the real line or the number line, um, we see that it degenerates down into a real number. If I can get it right on the line. Okay, there, so we, uh, plus point, there's a formatting issue there with uh, plot, what's it called? Plot label, but that's okay. So um, here, so we're down 0.03i, you can print it at zero. So uh, 2.04 on the real line. So these are just real numbers. It's important to remember that the real numbers are a subset of the complex numbers, um, or if you want, they're a linear subspace of dimension one. But anyway, the, any properties of the complex, of complex functions uh, that we're going to see, uh, you should be, uh, well, the idea is that it's a generalization of just the real line. So any properties of these complex functions that we're going to talk about will also work on real functions. It's just that they're constrained to the real line. Okay. All right. So let's move on to another interpretation. Complex numbers as stretches and rotations. So what if we think of points in the plane as xy pairs? So maybe as a column vector like this, x, y. Um, and then we uh, want to have some notion of multiplying these numbers together. Well, the, I'm not gonna go into the details right now because um, it's, a, it's a little bit formal, um, but you can see at the beginning of some complex analysis books, um, if you email me, I'll send you a specific reference, the, uh, which I don't remember off the top of my head right now. But, one interpretation is that complex numbers are these, uh, you can, sometimes you can think of them as two vectors. We could also think of them as linear transformations that act on each other. That's a little weird to think about, but again, it's just a perspective. So um, it's a particularly nice perspective because when you express a complex number in polar form, um, instead of as x plus uh, i, y, by the way, in Mathematica, the double struck i 
is um, so a, a, what you can just type escape ii to get to it, and it represents the imaginary unit. So, like for example, if I say um, here, I'll do square root of negative one minus i, and it's zero because those are the same thing. Okay, so anyway, you have uh, x plus i y, right? Uh, and another way to express a complex number is like this. Uh, so z is equal to x plus i y, where z is the real part, and y is the imaginary part. I'll even write that just to be clear. The imaginary part of z is x, and the uh, sorry, the real part of z is x, and the imaginary part of z is y. Okay, the imaginary and real parts are both uh, are both real. You just take out the i. Okay, for the imaginary part. And now for um, right, the other interpretation is we can do polar coordinates. So r uh, e to the i theta. These, uh, this relationship comes from Euler's formula, or Euler's identity, um, which uh, if you've taken complex analysis, uh, you'll have seen in like the first week. So this is the polar representation. The r is exactly what you think it is, the square root of x squared plus y squared, and the theta is, uh, is the angle of the vector. So for this vector, the angle is zero. For this vector, the angle is 45 degrees. I kind of gave away the punchline here of uh, what was going to happen to these points, but um, we'll get there. So. Okay, so here I can be explicit once again. So r is equal to the square root of uh, x of x squared plus y squared, and theta is equal to. I'm going to use uh, arc ten here. Well, actually, okay. So a quick note: you can use arc ten here, x comma y, and that will give you uh, inverse tangent, except uh, except it will place it at the proper um, point in the xy plane. So usually if you take arc tan, the single variable Mathematica arc tan function of an, uh, of, let's see, what would the, the argument would be a, um, the argument would be just a number, right? The argument would just be a number. It'll give you an angle, I believe between negative pi and pi, or maybe it's between zero and pi, whatever, whatever the, um, the, uh, standardized uh, agreed upon domain of inverse tangent usually is but the thing is that it just had to choose a domain like that so that um, because it's not allowed to spit out two different answers which is actually something we're going to talk about with the square root function later so um, I'm not going to go into details about that right now but it, I mean if you know what I'm talking about then um, you see the advantage of having our tan function that will automatically place it uh, with the proper with the uh, with, in the proper place in the complex plane, as opposed to just giving you a, the reference angle that you want. But um, we're actually going to use something a little uh, more specific to our needs here, arg, which um, again, if you've taken a complex analysis or complex variables, um, you know, is uh, it's just like the notation to say, give me the angle of that complex number. So I'm gonna put in x plus i, y, like to, you know, complexify this point x, y, uh, so to speak, and then arg will just give us the angle. So if the point's over here, then arg is going to be, what is this, like 135 degrees? There, that'd be 135 degrees, and the r, the, the arg would be that, and then r is the magnitude, and the magnitude of this vector is about like a little over, magnitude of this vector would be root two, magnitude of this vector would be oh actually I have typed up here right, so here the um, here the uh, magnitude is 1.9 and the angle is 2.35 in radians, okay, um. Yeah, radians is what I wanted there. Yeah, so the formatting here is a little weird. Um, I wasn't sure in Mathematica how to uh, do a plot label uh, string with an exponent, a, a variable exponent, because I had to two string the arg here, um, which I probably can figure out, but I don't feel like it right now. Okay, so anyway. Um, all right, now let's look at this rotation uh, and stretching interpretation. So what does it mean to multiply complex numbers? So um, again, I'm gonna try to hold off on going on going into too many details right now um, because you know it's an it's an entire field, uh, it's an entire class. Um, well, we're gonna go even past uh, the models here are gonna go past an undergraduate level uh, complex analysis or complex variables course. So I'm just I'm really going to try to touch on a bunch of ideas. Um, if you've seen enough to to totally understand that idea, fantastic. Um, maybe this is the first time you're seeing it visualized. If you don't know enough background to understand that idea, uh, that's fine. Um, hopefully uh, this will um, inception a couple of uh, models in your head. So when you get around to learning complex analysis, you already have uh, some, of the, some of these visualizations. Um, I've been trying to visualize these things for a long time, uh, like years, and I've been gradually putting together um, uh, models like this. And finally, I think I, I think I have a comprehensive set of them 
a comprehensive enough set of them to, uh, to start sharing some of these viewpoints that I've developed. Okay, so anyway, without going into too many details, multiplying two complex numbers um, means that the, their norms are, so, or magnitudes, radius, whatever you want to call it, are multiplied, and their angles, or args, are added. So multiplying complex numbers, every complex number has an associated magnitude and angle. Multiplying two complex numbers m creates a new complex number whose magnitude is the product of the magnitudes of the original two complex numbers and whose angle or argument is the sum of the uh, arguments of the uh, original two complex numbers. Okay? This is how complex multiplication works. So what if we just uh, stretch out this vector and we just, um, what if we multiply everything so the way this model works is you have the blue dots are fixed on this grid. They're just at every point. So like here's like, you know, 2 plus 2i, two uh, 3 plus 2i, 3 plus 3i, um, three, 2 plus 3i. Yeah, okay. This one's 3 plus 2i. I don't know if I said that right. Okay. So, and the cyan dots are uh, the transformations of them after they've been multiplied by whatever this locator and associated red vector are pointing to. So here I'm representing the complex number two, which yes, is a complex number, just a very simple complex number, um, no imaginary component. So I multiplied by the complex number two, the argument is zero, which means if you add zero to all the angles, they don't change. So um, nothing's gonna move away from the angle started at, um, but the magnitudes are gonna be multiplied by two. So here the magnitudes are multiplied by one. If I gradually move out to there to two, it's gonna stretch these out. So you see every cyan dot is just um, a bigger magnitude version of the blue dots. And in fact, if we go up to three, it's gonna stretch out further and further until you can't see them anymore. Okay, now let's talk about angle. So I'm trying to keep the magnitude about one, which means I'm gonna be moving this around and imagine a unit circle. I probably should have drawn a unit circle on this graph just for that purpose. But anyway, um, I'm gonna to try to keep the magnitude constant and just move the angle. And what that should do is add that angle to all of these points, which should rotate, uh, rotate them around the plane like this. And as you can see by my quivering, the magnitude uh, is also um, coming into effect. So uh, in fact, what, what we get is uh, when we pick an arbitrary point in the plane is we pick a magnitude that we wish to scale everything by. Here's a magnitude less than one, which is pulling everything in. And then we also pick an angle, which we'd like to rot rotate everything by. So in that way, complex multiplication is like um, a, it's like a stretch and a rotation. Sometimes that stretch is, um, it you know, makes it bigger and sometimes the stretch maybe should be thought of more as like a compression like this when the stretch um, air quotes is less than one. Uh, and when the stretch air quotes is equal to one, then you know, the magnitude stays the same. Okay, great. So again, that's an interpretation. That's a, a viewpoint. Let's move on. Okay, so um, uh, here I, I really need to uh, be, um, be brief about um, the underlying mathematics because uh, there's so much here, right? You know, this is this entire textbook of background that goes into these like nine models um, at least. Okay, so um, so here's a perspective for you, uh, which you may or may not have heard of before. It's called complex fractional linear transformation or a Mobius transformation. And what it looks like is, let me, let me write it for you. It's um, AZ plus B and then we'll put in a fraction over A, Z plus C. Okay, so there's lots of lots and lots of perspectives here. I'm gonna throw a whole bunch of words at you and any ones that you, you've heard before, um, you know, hopefully this helps to put some context in your brain of how all this fits together, okay? Uh, something that we're all gradually working on as mathematicians in training. So AZ plus B over AZ plus C. This is a complex, because uh, Z is complex, and A and B can in general be, A, B, C, and B, oh, sorry, A, B, C, D. A, B, C, and D are all in general complex. Um, complex is because all the numbers here are complex and the variables, fractional, it's a fraction, linear. Um, well, the top and bottom are both linear, like fraction of linear, but it's also linear in a, in a complex sense, which is hard to think about, but we'll get to that. Um, transformation, so transformation as in it's going to move all the points on the plane in a similar way to the way um, we are interpreting complex numbers in the previous uh, model as transformations. Um, we are interpreting a complex number as a transformation in the sense that uh, it is associated to the transformation you get when you multiply by that complex number. Here, uh, we, mean, we mean that in a similar sense, this, um, this is, I mean, this is a function, right? It's a rational function, um, which is, it's easier to see that that's a transformation, right? It's, it literally takes every point of Z as an input, turns it into a different complex number and spits it out. Um, and there's, some, there's a singularity here, but not a singularity if you consider complex infinity as part of the complex plane, which is something we'll get to. Or, touch on is how I should say that. Okay, um, 
All right. So it's also called a Mobius transformation. Uh, it's because has, um, I believe the Mobius part, because it has things to do with circles, uh, is like the context where it's called a Mobius transformation, but maybe not. But anyway, so um, these complex fractional linear transformations, they have tons of properties. One is that they are, uh, they preserve circles and lines on the plane. Um, together, those are called chains, because uh, uh, a line is kind of like a circle, except one of the points is at infinity. Complex infinity is uh, the same at every point all around the complex plane. If you go in any direction infinitely far, you get to the same infinity, unlike the real line where you have an infinity up to the right and negative infinity to the left. But that's just a construction. It's useful to us and for reasons that hopefully you'll see later um, to think of the edges of the complex plane all as one infinity, one complex infinity. So anyway, that's, that's not even an issue of dividing by zero here because that would turn into complex infinity. Um, anyway. So uh, these Mobius transformations are also the conformal transformations, which means they're the only transformations of the complex plane that preserve right angles. So if you want uh, right angles at the, before the transformation to preserve afterwards, then you want a conformal transformation, which means you want a Mobius transformation. Okay. Another way to think about it are they are uh, homeomorphisms. I believe that's the right word. Homeo how about let's go homeomorphisms? Um, actually. I'm going to hedge a little bit. I'm going to go isomorphisms. Yeah, okay. So uh, they're also the isomorphisms of the Riemann sphere. Okay, but that's something that I'm going to have to show you another model to, to get to. Okay, all right. So what do I mean by um, moving chains around? Okay, so, oops, let me run this model. Okay, so here we see uh, a bunch of, uh, we see the image circle and the um, original circle, both uh, starting at the image circle. And then I'm going to change these A, B, C, D, controlled A, B, C, D in this kind of setup. And we see uh, as we play with these, and this is the real component of A and the imaginary component of A, um, it changes how it acts on this. So um, when we start with B1 and C0 and D1, that just correlates all this, everything here shakes out the way I set it up to just it's A times some number. So this, this is really just the same thing as the last slide. It's complex multiplication. So that's zero that's zero and that's one right now in the model. So it's just A times Z, which is complex multiplication, like we saw in the last model. So we see that if we change the real part, it's gonna stretch it out. And if we change the imaginary part, it's gonna rotate it. Hopefully you can see those little green dots slowly rotating. Um, yes, apparently it's a little more subtle than that um, because it's growing a little bit there. But uh, maybe one of these isn't perfectly on zero or one like it's supposed to be. But anyway, so um, you can play with these and see all the ways it can move the circle around. What's cool is it keeps a circle. It keeps a circle a circle. Here we see the circle kind of blowing up. So there's a circle facing that way. Here's a circle facing that way. What is it right here? Well, you can think of it as a circle where the um, where the center is at infinity. Um, or maybe it's better to think of one of the points being at infinity. Well, maybe they're both at infinity. That's that's a, that's a little brain teaser for you. <laughs> but the, um, there's also a little motivation, um, if you think about it the right way, for why uh, complex infinity, excuse me, complex infinity should all be the same, like in every direction. Okay, so, um, right. We also have something called a circle inversion. Um, and the circle inversion, what that does, or almost circle inversion, because it's a technicality I'm not addressing. Um, it, well, if you have, let me, well, that's the translation. Okay, so the circle inversion, maybe you need to start with a different circle. There we go. Now you can see what circle inversion does. So a circle inversion inverts it around a circle. So um, you start with that blue one or the green one. It will start with the blue one, let's say. Um, and the circle inversion would be the green one. Uh, so it basically just flips the magnitude. Okay. Um, but then also uh, the, uh, Right, but then if you circle invert again, it'll uh, the green will go back to the blue. It's an involution. Doing it twice um, comes back to the identity. It's uh, it's its own inverse is what involution means. Okay, all right. So um, those and th those are all of the conformal transformations. Those are all the types of things you see. Um, that, you know, rotations, translations, shears. Um, actually, yeah, shears, um, stretching, uh, and inversions, and those are all. Uh, those are all the conformal transformations, and they're all wrapped up as uh, in this form. They all take this form. Okay, so let me stop that from running. I need the resources. Well, I'm gonna quit the kernel because it's mad at me. So I have too many things open. Okay, great. Uh, not mad at me anymore. Nice. All right. So uh, let's look at something called the stereographic projection, which is what I said with the Riemann sphere earlier. 
Okay, and again, I, I know this is a lot to throw at you. So whichever pieces and parts uh, you like, good. Think about it for a couple of days. Uh, whichever pieces and parts you see, in, uh, you know, irrelevant to your studies, great. Uh, great with that too. Um, after, uh, from my experience, uh, slashing through complex analysis is been very difficult and it's very hard to pin down all the perspectives. Um, and part of that is because the the higher theory um, that it's, that makes it all make sense it, uh, is deals with manifolds um, and differential geometry type like flavored stuff. So the uh, and we'll get to that towards the end. But that's part of why some of this stuff is so hard to understand without like a, a more rigorous um, theory uh, built around it. But the thing is that the intermediate steps are useful for so many things like. Um, you know, if you're learning physics at an undergraduate level, like 200 level physics classes, the complex numbers are very useful for um, for thinking about uh, things like, um, let's see, solutions to simple harmonic motion, right? Uh, those, those are complex. Quantum uses complex functions, right? And you don't need to understand all the details of complex analysis or the more general rigorous um, manifold formulation to use the, the tools on these different levels. So um, we're actually kind of roughly going up in levels as we as we go through this, but uh, sort of. But anyway, okay, so this is the Riemann sphere. So what it is, is is the sphere that's centered at the origin, uh, radius one, and the idea is we're going to project the entire complex plane onto the Riemann sphere. So let me um, such as our yeah, okay. So there's a lot to look at. Let me um, let me try to start with a simple example. Okay, so see there's the green circle and dots uh, around, oh, I can increase resolution as a good feature I built in. Nice, oh, nice, there we go, very clear. Okay, so the idea is you start at the North Pole and you send a line uh, down, so here, so maybe I can, so you start at the North Pole and you send a line down like that, that cuts through the sphere. You basically just start at the North Pole and you draw a line between the North Pole and a point on the complex plane, say this green one. It will definitely intersect the sphere somewhere at the corresponding yellow point, and that's the projection onto the Riemann sphere, and vice versa. If you start with the point of the Riemann sphere and you draw a ray from the North Pole through that point on the Riemann sphere, it'll intersect the complex plane, and that's projection from the complex plane, or sorry, from the Riemann sphere to the complex plane. Um, let me also show you what happens when. Uh, the radius is less than one. So the projection, the, the ray would start at the North Pole, uh, cut through the, this inside part of the complex plane, the inside of the unit disk, and hit, uh, and then hit this yellow point down here. So hopefully you can imagine that kind of like ray, like goes from here, down to here like that. And for points, uh, points on the unit circle, they just kind of line up. But the points uh, outside the unit circle, the ray comes like this, cuts through the Riemann sphere, and then hits the plane like that. Yeah, like that. Okay, so the idea is there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between all of the points on the complex plane and all of the points of Riemann sphere, with the exception of the North Pole. Where does the North Pole, North Pole go? Well, let's imagine something, right? Let's draw. Let's uh, so imagine in your head. Um, I should have used the model here uh, that has a, a ray in it. When I when I post this, I'll I'll post that model also because I actually do have the ray in one of the models. So you have a ray goes from here through this point and hits the complex plane. If I increase the radius. We see that the yellow circle moves up and up and up on the on the Riemann sphere, and uh, the ray gets um, to a more and more extreme angle, like closer and closer to 90 degrees. When the radius is very very large, then in fact the ray is going to be almost at 90 degrees, and in the limit, as the radius goes to infinity, the ray will be at 90 degrees. And if it is, if the ray is coming, if the ray is tangent to the top of that sphere, it doesn't matter which direction the ray is pointing. It's never good. It doesn't. It doesn't intersect the. It doesn't intersect the Riemann sphere, um, and more so, it doesn't intersect the Riemann sphere. Intersect the Riemann sphere in any of those directions. So what do we have? We, we have two features here, right? One feature is it doesn't intersect the Riemann sphere anymore. So we can just think of the projection as, maybe we should think of the projection as the North Pole is going to complex infinity. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't intersect the Riemann sphere again, and it also doesn't um, intersect the complex plane anywhere finitely. It goes off in the limit towards complex infinity. Uh, and the second feature is that it does that in every single direction. So this is the motivation for um, thinking of complex, well, a motivation, yeah, to say uh, that this is um, that the complex infinity is the same in every direction. The idea being that if we say that, then what's called the extended complex plane, so the complex plane plus or more accurately, union, the point at infinity, complex infinity, um, that is isomorphic to 
uh, the Remind Sphere. I think we actually have a little bit better than isomorphic. Uh, I'm not sure what word I should use. Homeomorphic? I'm not sure. But the, uh, the point, it's a conformal transformation. Um, the right angles on the complex plane will be right angles on the sphere when you project them onto the Riemann sphere. And right angles of Riemann sphere, when you project them onto the complex plane, will again be right angles. Uh, furthermore, it has this circle and line chains preserving structure like we saw in the complex plane. If you have a circle on the Riemann sphere, it projects onto a circle onto the, uh, oh, hold on. It projects onto a circle onto the complex plane, like this. Also, you can change you can change the center of that circle like this, and all of these circles will project to circles on the complex plane. You can move it around a bit like this. Change the radius, make it small. Oh, that's making it big. Make it small. Whatever. Okay. Okay. Um, and even more so. All right. Now, uh, this uh, this is a lot to look at. Uh, and again, if, if you're interested in this, I encourage you to download this model from my website and just like play with it. So, um, I, and I really should add an annotation here, but all right, so let's, let's get this straight. Yellow circle, original circle. Green circle, projection onto the complex plane. Purple circle is the transformation of the yellow circle under a Mobius transformation. And blue circle is the projection of the purple circle under the stereographic projection, which is what I call the projection, what mathematicians call the projection from the Riemann sphere to the complex plane. And also, the blue circle is the Mobius transformation of the green circle because you can do the Mobius transformation on either and that's what makes it an isomorphism because you can do these transformations on the sphere or on the complex plane it turns out to be the same great good rewind that uh, a minute and listen to that sentence like two more times okay all right so um these a b c d sliders and we control the Mobius transformations and we see no matter what we do uh we end up with Oh, okay. Well, it appears now actually the purple is the original, the yellow is the transformed, and the blue is the original, and the green is transformed. Just the way I set this up. But okay. So um, we see that everything's still a circle, and or a line. Sometimes you turn into lines. Let's let's see. I wonder if I can. Let's see if I can get this to turn into a line. Can I can I get this to turn into a line? Can I get this? Uh, now I've, I've I've messed with the other the other coordinates too much to uh to force this into the line version. But anyway, so if you played this long enough, one of these or some of these li uh, circles turn into lines, which are really just complex circles where one of the points happens to be a complex infinity. Okay, um, which which will be very clear when you look at the uh the circle on the Riemann sphere because there'll still be a circle, um, but it'll pass through the North Pole. So maybe you can try to imagine that. Imagine um I could get to it here, but again, I don't want to spend too much time in any one model because there's just so much to talk about. So if you have a circle that is um, like the prime meridian on Earth and it passes through the North Pole, that will project to a line on the complex plane. Hopefully you can see that. But it's still just a circle in the Riemann sphere. It's a circle where one of the points happens to be complex infinity. Great. Okay. Uh, or aka the North Pole. And let's see what this almost circle inversion does. Hope it doesn't break anything. Cool. Well, that's that's not very easy to look at, is it? <laughs> it's uh, kind of hard to imagine why this is a circle inversion of that. But um, on the Riemann sphere, we see that the circles are not quite opposites, but there's some very nice symmetry going on there. Okay, so circle inversion is some symmetry of the Riemann sphere. And again, uh, and actually the Mobius transformations, here's the other interpretation. The Mobius, transformation, Mobius transformations are symmetries of the Riemann sphere. So translating the complex plane is like rotating the Riemann sphere. Um, rotation in the complex plane is like rotating the Riemann sphere in a different direction. Um, circle inversions are like flipping the Riemann sphere on its head. So North Pole becomes South Pole, vice versa. Um, and then uh, that's that's basically that's basically everything that's going on. Um, I might have missed uh, shears. Yeah, the shears are combinations of those things. Uh, oh, and stretching. But um, stretching is uh, stretching is well, actually, it's a good thought experiment to think about what stretching would look like on the Riemann sphere. Um, so all the points, with any of these isomorphisms of the Riemann sphere, all the points are still there. They just get shuffled around in a continuous way. So stretching is kind of like forcing all the points in the Riemann sphere towards the North Pole, um, like uh, contracting them in. Like imagine that the Earth is a Riemann sphere and there's some like global tide that sends all the water towards the North Pole. So it will like bunch up towards the North Pole. Uh, maybe that's a good visualization. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, so, all right, let's move on. Okay, oh, let me stop evaluating. 
Okay, and this is another version of that model with something called a spanning vector, and I just, there's way too much to go into. Uh, I don't want this lecture to be three hours. Okay, so, okay. Like I said, I want to break this up into like 10 separate videos, so I, I want to give you a taste of everything. Okay, let's move on. So um, only on four. Wow. Okay, we have our work cut out for us, <laughs> but hopefully now um, we're all we're all used to looking at complex things. Um, right. I also need to remember to show you, um, uh, point out to you little uh, little bits of the code that will be useful to you later. Okay. Um, here's another. Um, I'm only spend like 30 seconds on the side. Here's another interpretation of Mobius transformations as conformal transformations of the unit disk. Un unpack that later, okay? So uh, the left is the start and the right is the conformal transformation of it. Red points get red points, green points get green points. These are all the ways, These are all the ways to send the unit disk to the unit disk conformally, meaning you preserve right angles, okay? Great. Um, moving on. So uh, let's get to visualizing complex functions. Why is visualizing complex functions so hard? Um, well, right now I showed you a whole bunch of stuff about Mobius transformations, which um, I, I, I would now like to ask you to uh, uh, purge from your minds for for, for the next uh, 20 minutes, because um, I would like to uh, go to a more uh, concrete interpretation. Oh, well, concrete's the wrong word. No, concrete's how about this? I like to go to interpretation of complex functions that is more similar to what you've seen for real functions. So uh, what I did previously was I just showed off a whole bunch of um, stuff about how complex analysis is useful for things like uh, Mobius transformations and conformal mappings and projections and stuff like that. But now I wanna um, try to give you um, a more intuitive sense of how complex functions work relative to the way you're used to seeing how real functions work. So on the left here, we have a real function. Um, a, B, and C are these sliders, A, B, C. So if I move this, change that, okay, parabolas. So um, the, what's the problem with visualizing complex functions? Why is this so hard? Why don't complex analysis textbooks and professors just, just draw all the functions that they want you to see? Well, the reason is that a real function goes from R to R. So you can have the x-axis as the input, like the domain, and the y-axis as the, the range. And then you just glue them together, and you're basically using R2 to, um, to describe this function. But the complex, the complex functions, they take in the complex plane, uh, as input, which is two real dimensions, and then they spit out a complex number, which is two more real dimensions, which means if you were to glue the range dimensions to the domain dimensions in the same way that we do here, you'd have four dimensions, and that's more than our spatial dimensions allowed. Um, you can use time, maybe, but that's not, still not going to be super satisfying. You can use color, but anyway, um, for our fourth dimension. But anyway, uh, one common way of doing it, which I don't find super enlightening personally, but it's it's kind of like the the first obvious thing to do to try to get hold of what's going on is to plot the real surface and the imaginary surface separately. So a complex function takes um, a complex number from the complex plane, um, and then it spits out uh, something in the form of like u plus iv. And you can say u is the real component and v is the imaginary component. u is the surface, so it's like a function over r2, and so is v. So um, here, orange is the real surface and blue is the imaginary surface. So at any point, if you wanna know the complex number, you have to go to that point on the plane, you go up, you hit an orange surface, and whatever this magnitude is, that's the real part, and you go up and you hit the blue, and whatever this magnitude is, that's the imaginary part. Okay, so um, the fundamental theorem of algebra, something you might've heard of, it's, uh, it says that every polynomial, every real polynomial has um, a complex solution, okay? Well, not every polynomial has a real solution, just look at this guy, it doesn't, it doesn't touch the, the x-axis, it's never equal to zero, but it does have a complex solution. Um, the way we can see that is it would be the point where the real part and imaginary part of the output of the complex function is equal to, are both equal to zero. So maybe that's like around there or something. Um, again, it's kind of it's still kind of hard to see even with this visualization. Um, but the, the catch about why you don't see it on this graph is that the input point that made that happen isn't a real number, it's a complex number. So uh, this point here that projects up to the zero, zero, it's not on the real line, it's somewhere else on the complex plane. The, the functions that we look at, they have solutions only when the solutions happen to be real, which which is actually like when, when you think of the general context of complex analysis, like a ridiculous restriction, like like who cares, right? In physics, we care because um, observables have to be real. So if you ask physics, hey, uh, when is the when is this function going to be equal to zero? And it gives you a complex number. The, the physics is telling you this. It's telling you. Um, yeah, well, it's, it, would, it would be zero at this complex number, but since you're a physicist, 
in most contexts, you're just thinking of complex numbers as like a tool to get back to real stuff. And we know you can't measure imaginary numbers like meters, time, uh, meters, seconds, joules. That's all, those are all real numbers, obviously. So you're never gonna be able to measure the complex. You can only measure the real component. The way physicists use the model in many contexts, um, some things in physics actually like think of them as complex is, is, a, good, is a good thing to do. But um, most of the like, kinematics things that you're going to see complex numbers, uh, where you're going to see complex numbers appearing in physics, they're just thinking of, it, of the complex numbers as, um, as, as a tool, and the real part is all we ever care about, uh, because that's all we can observe. We can only observe the real part, um, which is kind of weird. Like, like it's a, so is physics saying that um, there's imaginary, like imaginary meters, imaginary seconds? Well, maybe, but again, it's just a model. So um, it's a model that works, right? But, but again, so to make that model make any sort of physical sense, it, instead of saying, oh, well, it's a, it's a three I meters, we just say, oh, okay, that's not an observable quantity, which means that the thing we ask physics is just apparently impossible. We ask physics, hey, can we have a solution to this equation? Um, and really we're asking them, hey, can we have a real solution to this equation? And it gives us back a complex number, like if you use the quadratic formula on here and you end up with square root of a negative, um, like a negative discriminant, then, um, the right way to interpret the physics is physics is trying to tell you, sorry, no real solution exists. But okay, back to math, right? For mathematicians, um, complex plane is, you know, it's this, this great structure that's, um, that lets you do more things than just the real line can do. Um, and just because there's no solution in the real, for the real polynomial, like whatever, right? There's complex solutions. And that's, that's where the fundamental theorem of algebra comes in. Um, and it also, we're, we're lucky here. Maybe it's not luck, it's, it's the higher structure, but, the, um, but here's, here's the lucky thing, right? Lucky, air quotes, thing. Um, for the real numbers, if you want the solutions to any real polynomial, you need a complex number. Uh, actually, same thing with rationals. If you want a solution to any rational polynomial, you need a real number, like you have to go up. And then for any real polynomial, the solutions, a lot of them are complex numbers, so you have to go up again. But complex polynomials, like the coefficients, instead of having like 2.32 and 2.42 and one here, instead of having all real numbers here, if I had like complex numbers here as the coefficients and complex numbers as the variables, um, complex polynomial, polynomials, all of their solutions are still complex. That mean, The way to say that in math words, math jargon, is that the complex numbers are an algebraically closed field, which means that any polynomial, any complex polynomial has complex solutions, unlike the reals, because real polynomials sometimes have complex solutions, which aren't real. Okay. Um, Great. So uh, I really need to start um, fulfilling my promise of going quickly through these things and not spending too much time on details of each uh, individual perspective, but because uh, uh, we still have some uh, other things I want to show you. So let's pick up the pace a little bit. And again, digest the perspectives you like and ignore the ones you don't. Okay. Um, cool. Or maybe keep them in the back of your mind. So this is what z squared does to circles. So z squared, so what does that do, right? It'll square all the radiuses, uh, radii, um, magnitudes. It'll square the magnitude of every complex number and it'll multiply the angle by two. And you can think about why that, why that is by uh, a little later if you want, like write it down if, if you haven't seen that before, right? Just write, as R, write the complex number as r times e to the i theta and then square that. And then it'll be really clear uh, why the angle is doubled and the radius is squared, right? Why the, the power that you raise the complex number to it raises the radius or the norm of the complex number to that power also, but it multiplies the angle by that number. Okay. So here you can't see the angle part because like the red circle going to the red circle, where's the unit circle? Uh, the orange one. So the orange one goes to the orange because the magnitude one squared is one, but you can't see any of the rotation because, um, because the, the circle just lands on top of itself. So the circle interpretation here is just good for, um, these circles are just good for showing us, uh, what happens to the radius and it's, it's squared. So let's go, we, we have, we can show other examples here. E to the Z looks like this. What's going on? Uh, the best way I've thought of it, uh, I've been able to think about it is it's trying to swerve zero here because E to the Z can't be zero for anything. Like what are you gonna raise Z to to make it zero? Um, log Z, this one's super weird. Branch cuts, okay. All right, it's a mess, <laughs> but um, sine Z, if you zoom out on sine t, you actually find that this is this whole like curvy uh, curvy structure is um, is periodic uh, in a sense where it like it but oscillates. It's like it's like curvy like this and that's curvy like this and that's curvy like this and like this again over and over again. Uh, sine z sine on the whole complex plane super weird, way weirder than just sine in the real line. Um, cosine similar deal. It's weird. Um, this this one looks like it has a little more structure to it at least, but. Um, Cinch, which is hyperbolic sign. 
and cos, hyperbolic cosine. Um, if you're wondering, uh, sine and cosine just tell you the coordinates. So sine and cosine of an angle theta just tell you the coordinates of the point on the unit circle that's at angle theta. Hyperbolic cosine, hyperbolic sine tell you the coordinates of a point that's at angle theta on the unit's hyperbola, if you will, it's hyperbola, where the right-hand side of the of the quadratic equation is equal to one. Okay. But anyway, so um, so z to the point five. So square root. Aha! This is interesting. Um, we've isolated to the right half of the complex plane. Keep that in mind. We're gonna come back to that. So real quick. So if you raise to the power of one half, it's going to halve all of the magnitudes and how? Uh, sorry, it's going to square root all the magnitudes and halve all the angles. So usually here we have points all the way. We have points here at zero and at you know uh, pi over two and at pi sorry at pi over four and pi over two and at um, wherever this is like five pi over four and at two pi like all the way around. But here zero to two pi gets crushed down to just zero to pi. It's gonna be really important later. Okay, complex functions acting on a colored disk. This is just another way, another common way of visualizing complex um, numbers because uh, so I, I shaded this whole thing and then the, sh the shading correlates over here so you can kind of see where every point goes. So let's see what happens to z squared. Um, it's got bigger, okay. Um, actually should wrap around twice, but it's uh, it's landing on top of each other, so you can't really see that. But again, we'll get to that. Z looks like this. Ah, looks pretty nice, actually, in this color. Um, log z turned to a square. That's weird, but also cool. Um, comp e and z log and e, keep this in mind when you study complex analysis. E and log help switch from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. And um, you can tease out the details of which does which, like on paper, like it's a good exercise. But yeah, that's that's what they do. Okay, so sine z looks like that. Got cosine z, cinch. Uh, whoops, gosh. And square root. I mean, square root shoves it onto half the plane. Okay, uh, this is a sneak preview of what we're going to do next. Uh, we'll we'll get to that later. All right, and um, this is lines and set circles. So just so the circles, um, they had the advantage of showing us what happens to magnitudes, but angles all got caught up. Um, angles got washed out. But here this time, um, we see what happens to angles. So if you square it, this dark orange line went onto the y-axis. Its angle doubled. This green line went down to here, but it's it's uh, you can't really see it against the actual axis. Um, this red line went to let's see, that's 135 degrees. So I guess it went to 270 degrees, which is there. Ah, if I can't, it's, uh, it's overlapped by something else here. Um, all these lines, some of these lines are landing on top of each other, but you can look closely, more closely at that later. So again, I'm trying to, to give you some ideas and then um, to, to get you on certain tracks of thinking for visualizing these things. Okay. Okay. Uh, strange ultimate behavior of sine with respect to zooming out. If you zoom out, this is what sine does. This is just like, feels like nonsense to me. I don't really understand why it does this yet. Um, but you know, one of the mysteries to unravel. Okay. Um, and then apparently analytic transformation from unit circle to upper half plane. Uh, this is just some other transformation, which, um, yeah, it takes the unit disk to the upper half plane, which are different models of hyperbolic geometry. If you ever are studying hyperbolic geometry, complex analysis is super useful because the Mobius transformations are also uh, ways to move between hyperbolic models. There's so much math wrapped up in all of this. And there's so many perspectives for all these things. I'm just trying to throw all these perspectives at you. And some of them will be useful to your stuff and to your studies and some of them won't be. But um, this is a transformation that takes the unit disk to the upper half plane. It will take uh, every point on the upper half plane. Uh, so the, just like the positive part of the plane um, in the y axis sense. Um, so anything above the x axis rather, that's a good way of putting it, has a correlated point on a unique correlated point on the unit disk and vice versa. Okay, let me move this around a little bit. It's kind of cool to see this move around in the upper half plane. Okay, cool. Uh, moving on. Okay, so uh, complex integration. I'm seriously not going to spend too much time on this because um, I, I, um, probably many, uh, probably most of you haven't even gotten to this in like a math class yet. So I'm just going to put an idea in your head so that when you get to it in a math class, then um, you'll have like a head start on some of the intuition, or maybe not a head start at some of the intuition. This is an intuition that I like, um, that I have found to be useful. So this is, a, this is a formula that you're gonna see in complex analysis textbooks. I call it the path absorption formula. What it does is, well, I guess we'll start first with what a complex integral is. A complex integral is an integral of a complex function around a contour. A 
contour is a line in the complex plane. You could parameterize it with a variable t if you want. Um, this is the context of complex integration. You always integrate complex numbers um, uh, along a line. Try not to think of complex integration over an area. Um, it's not the same kind of complex area integral as in the real case for a couple of reasons. Um, and uh, yeah, so you try, don't, try not to think of complex integration as area under a curve. It doesn't, it doesn't really hold up. Um, think of it as uh, the integral of a complex function along a certain line, okay? the, this contour C. Um, well, what does that mean? It's kind of like comparing the value of the complex function at each point, which is also a complex number, to the complex number on the contour at each point. And it's kind of like a dot product, but not really. But anyway, so um, I wanted a way to like actually understand it. So this is the transformation they give you in textbooks, where what it essentially does is it transforms the integral into just an integral on the line segment 0 to 1, but now you have a much more complicated function. Um, and then that inspired me to create a different kind of formula. So I haven't seen this one in a textbook. Um, I just kind of like came up with it because I wanted a certain interpretation called function absorption, where we absorb the entire function, except for this just little w, dw, um, into the contour. Okay, so um, what does it look like? Let me pick z equal to 2. Okay, so z squared. So this is the standard contour integral picture. So here's the contour, it's the unit circle. That I picked the unit circle as the contour. Here is the complex plane, the whole vector field. It, um, each point in the complex plane, I represent it as a vector. So, um, but actually, uh, well, uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> what this vector field is, is what happens when you transform the complex plane by the function f, and then take all those complex numbers and consider them as vectors, turn into a vector field. So like x plus i, y is now x comma y, like that vector. Okay. And the colors correspond to magnitudes. So we see, let me just show you z to the one first. So um, when we don't do anything, when the complex function is just z, it just it just stays, it's just uh, the original, it looks like this. This is what the complex plane looks like when you interpret all the complex points as vectors. Okay, what if we do z squared though? This is kind of like we get two copies of everything. Here um, on the top half, we've uh, this, so let's just like follow along the unit circle. Here, this vector is pointing this way, but it's rotating fast. It's rotating very fast. And by the time we get to here, um, it's already back to the rotation it was when it started. When it goes around again, it's back to the rotation it was when it started. So here's the intuition, right? A complex monomial, like z to the n, so how about z squared to start? It's going to square the magnitude, and it's going to double the angle. If we think of it on the unit circle, 1 squared is just 1, so it stays in the unit circle in terms of magnitude. It's just going to rotate around the unit circle. But the thing is, the interval 0 to 2 pi times 2 is now the interval 0 to 4 pi. z squared will wrap all of the points on the unit circle around the unit circle twice. So the points from 0 to pi get stretched out over 0 to 2 pi, and then the points from pi to 2 pi also get stretched out over 0 to 2 pi. So they end up with two copies of everything landing onto the complex plane. Another way of thinking about that is by hitting the plane with this function and then looking at what the new plane looks like. So in this sense, we're thinking of a complex function as a transformation of the complex plane into something that looks like the complex plane copied on top of itself twice, okay? It's kind of like the whole co complex plane is wrapped up in the top here and it's wrapped up in the bottom here. All right, um, and then this complex, uh, inter inter this contour integral here, you can kind of think of it like this. What is the average vector along this contour? So here we're pointing out, 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 and then all the way back. So we kind of cancel each other out. It'd be zero on that half and zero on this half too. So if you study any complex analysis, you'll know there's a very famous theorem of complex analysis called the, uh, let's see, which one is it? The Cauchy integral formula. Um, and what it says, uh, so the Cauchy integral formula, um, well, that's like an application of what I'm talking about. Here, here's the, the punchline that I'm trying to visualize here. The integral around a closed contour of any analytic complex function is going to be zero. We have to break this down a little bit. Analytic is the same as holomorphic. Analytic means that it's complex differentiable. That just means it satisfies the Cauchy Riemann equations, which really just means it's it's di um, differentiable in a complex sense as opposed to a real sense. Now there's an amazing theorem that says analyticity is the same as being holomorphic. Holomorphic means that there is a power series expansion of the function at every point, which means it's just written kind of like a Taylor series, like just one plus z plus z squared plus z cubed with certain on and on with certain um, coefficients. And that's really weird. So 
every the complex field is really uh, the complex uh, um, functions are really weird. If a complex function is differentiable, the complex differentiable, which means analytic, it's actually smooth. It actually has all of its complex derivatives, and that also means it's holomorphic, which means it has a series representation as a sum as a weighted sum of these polynomial terms. Um, uh, right. Yes. So. Right, and then we have the extra weird thing that all of those polynomial terms, the integral of them around a closed contour are zero. So the integral of z squared around a closed contour in the complex plane, any closed contour, a circle, a weird kidney bean shape, something that self intersects, as long as it comes back to where it started, zero. The integral of z cubed around a complex contour, zero. The integral of z or integral of one around a complex contour, zero. The integral of like z to the 10 around a complex contour, zero, okay? This is, this is super weird. And also you have to think about complex analysis for a while to even understand like what we're trying to do, right? But um, so, so why is complex integration so weird? One way of thinking about it is, it trans is a complex function translates the complex plane into, uh, into something that has a complex structure. It kind of looks like a complex plane, kind of like a complex plane on top of itself twice or three times or four times or five times and on and on. Um, and then when you take the complex, uh, when you take the, uh, the contour integral, what you're doing is you're averaging that uh, that vector interpretation along the contour. Okay, this is the interpretation with the path absorption. So um, you can kind of ignore all these vectors up here. I kind of just like uh, superimposed them there to get a feel for what's going on. But you see again, we can take this rotating vector approach, and it all cancels out. This is this is a better way. This is a um, more actively the rotating vector approach than over here. So I think there's another subtlety here with the interpretation. But but my whole point is that this is hard to interpret. So that's why we have these two transformations. The book gives you this transformation. Um, books will give you this transformation. And then my transformation is this, where what I like to do is I want, to, what I want wanted to do is instead of absorbing, instead of thinking of the function as a transformation of the space, I want to think of it all as just a transformation of the contour. Leave the space alone. Let's stay on the complex plane. And I just want to really screw up the contour and have that um, represent everything that I want. So let me let me pick a like an ASCII function z cubed. Whoops. Oh, there we go. Z cubed. Um, and then let me pick a contour that's not just the unit circle. How about this? How about the unit circle plus one plus i? So shifted. Okay. Wow, that's our contour now. Very ugly, right? But it's symmetric. So here's another here nugget. Here's another nugget of perspective for you. Just add it to the list. So if you interpret a complex integral in this way in this third way, this uh, what I call the function absorption uh, transformation. Then um, the complex integral, well, a complex number you can think of as a point mass somewhere in space. And then the complex integral here will give you the center of mass of the contour as if the contour were a wire of constant density in the complex plane. This is very useful for physics if you're looking for the center of mass of a wire in two dimensional space. So if you're looking for the center of mass of a, of a wire of constant density in the complex plane, what you would do is you would basically just average the positions of all the points. Um, you average these position, position vectors, uh, and then you would get um, a center of mass, which is also a vector somewhere, like a point, if you want, in the plane. So uh, the center of mass is like a point that you get from averaging the points of all of the points along the wire. Uh, a concrete way to do this is just give them all a complex name add them all together in an infinite way, which is an integral, an infinite sum, and then you get the center of mass. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, and then this is just a calculation of the actual center of mass. Okay, so, and let's let's not dive into this. Uh, this is just for a branch cut situation. There's there's infinite levels of complexity to put on top of these things. Okay, so, all right, we're almost done. So um, uh, if you've studied Fourier analysis, then uh, Fourier analysis, then um, you, uh, you'll you know what I'm talking about here. So it's like for signal processing or harmonic analysis, it's breaking down a function into uh, sine waves and cosine waves, which in a complex domain is the same thing as saying breaking it down into um, exponential functions and exponential functions with negative powers. So let me show you an example here. So um, this is a path, like a really, really ugly path that, that lands on top of itself in the complex plane. I randomly generated it here. I can, I can make a new one. Randomly generated path that lands on itself. Then you can Fourier decompose, Fourier decompose this into these uh, sines and cosines, or if you want, into these e to the 
two pi k terms and e to the negative two pi k terms. And um, what you get is, uh, sorry, uh, e to the two pi kt and e to the negative two pi kt. Oh, throw an i in there too, right? <laughs> um, and then those are actually all circles. So then the Fourier decomposition of a closed complex path is always really just a weighted sum of complex circles. So many perspectives here, right? Okay, so lots and lots of information I'm throwing at you. Um, again, if you want more information on any one specific model, uh, shoot me an email. Okay, I'd be happy to talk about this and uh, maybe gain some perspective that you have from one of your classes. Uh, and it's for a non-closed contour. Um, I had to do it with dots because I had to do this, new, uh, this as a numerical simulation. You see I'm launching eight kernels here as I'm parallelizing it. Um, oh, I also have neglected to show you pieces of this code along the way. Um, so one very useful thing that you should know, re-m. Re-m takes, um, re takes a complex number and it spits out the real part and the imaginary part. So here, re-m of two plus three i, it spits it out uh, as, a, uh, as a, uh, a pair, so as like a point in R2. Oops, let me stop that. Ah, it's mad, okay. <laughs> Which is very useful if you want to take a complex number and put it on the plane. Okay, re-m. Okay, um, so let me quit the kernel. Okay, and then let's, uh, let's run that. And let's put some random coefficients in here. And run this. Oh, actually, I don't think I use those coefficients. Yeah, it's fine. Um, oh, this is an ambitious simulation, isn't it? How about this? Let's let's um let's make it a less ambitious simulation. Twenty-five and one hundred. Let's see what that does. Where it should be. Uh, 20 times faster, 20 times faster than the version before. There. So here's our, this is a complex contour that, or com, uh, it's, yeah, I guess it is a complex contour. Yeah, here's a complex contour that doesn't end on, its, that doesn't end on itself, so it's not closed. Um, it's a non-closed complex contour, right? And, the, uh, and then these are all the circles that, when you add them up, approximate it. Okay, so... Um, Right, I highly suggest the three blue one brown video on um, on FOIA analysis. Uh, that's my inspiration for this center of mass interpretation of uh, FOIA analysis mixed with complex analysis. So three blue one brown FOIA analysis. Okay, or maybe it's called harmonic analysis. Whichever. All right. Last model. Okay. So uh, this is really the punchline. So why is complex analysis so weird? Why? Um, why? So I, I've I've glossed over something else that you'll see in an in intro complex uh, analysis or complex variables course. That's very very important. Um, roots. So let's talk about roots for a second. What's the square root of one? It's one. What's the square root of two? It's one point four one four or whatever. But it's also negative one point four one four because that also squares the two. Okay. So that's two points on the real line that spit out of our square root function. So like a square root function isn't really a function. It's what we call a multifunction. It spits out two different or multiple different answers. A function is supposed to, spit, supposed to spit out one answer, but our multifunction spits out two answers. What about the cube root? Let's do cube root of, I don't know, um, eight, right? Cube root of eight. Um, two works. Uh, let's see. Well, this is a tough example. I'm going <laughs> to, let me, let me hedge a little bit. How about the fourth root of 16? Two works. Negative two works. 2i works and negative 2i works with four roots. Okay, how about square root of negative uh, four? Square root of negative four, you have uh, 2i and you have negative 2i. Um, here's here's the punchline. Okay, so the uh, nth roots of any complex number, there are n of them. So if you have, take the seventh root of a complex number, there are seven complex numbers that when you raise those complex numbers to seven, they all land on that same number. So the nth root, and the nth complex root function is actually an n multifunction that will take a number and spit out all the roots. So um, you do this already, kind of when you do you you do this already really when you put a plus or minus in front of a square root. Really, what you're saying is, oh, it spits out the positive version and the negative version. Those are both things that you can square to get back the original number. Complex analysis goes even further. The seventh root of a complex number gives you seven numbers because there are seven numbers that all square to that. 
or sorry, <laughs> seven numbers that all power of seven to that. So let me show you an example. Let's do cube. Okay, so this locator is, uh, oh, actually, I want to show you over here. Okay, so um, this blue point is the number, and these three green points are all of its cube roots. You, you'll notice that the cube roots are all spaced out by an even angle, which is an amazing symmetry we see on the complex plane that really, um, when you when you dive dive into it and start to understand it, makes uh, roots of any order um, make a lot more sense. So, um, uh, right, get through that those first couple chap chapters of complex variables, complex analysis, and then come back to this. Right. So, uh, right. Here, what's the right way to think about this? The right way to think about this is. Uh, and this and this is high this is higher level mathematics. This isn't something that you learn undergrad, um, but it's a perspective that I've been <laughs> uh, trying to get to, um, you know, all through undergrad. And now finally, I'm uh, uh, tackling some more abstract mathematics in my masters, and I'm ready to like understand this kind of structure, um, which makes a lot of things complex analysis make more sense. So here's a little crash course in it. It's called a Riemannian manifold. So a manifold is something that looks locally Euclidean, but in general, it can be a really nasty surface. Um, what we do is a complex function is really a map from one Riemannian manifold to another. The complex plane is a Riemannian manifold, um, but also this spirally thing on the right is a Riemannian manifold. <sighs> okay, so here's here's the spark notes. Complex plane, a complex power like z cubed will take the complex plane and it'll stretch it out into this like triple cover of the complex plane, this like spirally winded thing. And really the spiraling part is just a visualization of the complex plane, or sorry, in three space. It's just a way to sort of embed it in three space, but it's not really embedded because, um, because uh, this part here is identified with that this part down here. But anyway, so um, where was I going with that? Right, so it stretches it out into this bigger Riemann surface and a complex number cubed will then have, uh, it'll, well, let me just show you. So as you move this around the complex plane, you can see the image point. See that, that vertical line there is mathematics is trying to compute. It actually is exactly what's going on here. This teleports down to there. But then if we actually drew that, it would self-intersect and then it's not a good embedding in three space. In fact, you can't embed these Riemann surfaces in three space. But anyway, so as I move this around, we see it moves around three times as fast on the surface on the right. So I get to this one third point, like a third way through the radians of the, the two pi radians, the two pi over three radians. And we've gone around one sheet of the of the right Riemann surface already. We go around here, and we go around the sheet again. And I go around here, and we go around the sheet again. But when you look at the image, and then if we go past this line, we're back where we started. But if you look at, but the way they usually draw this in the complex plane, and all the models I've shown you up until now, actually take this entire Riemann surface, and they just collapse it, they project it down the complex plane, they just glue it all together. And that's why uh, you see some of the behavior that you do. The right way to think about this is on a Riemann surface that, that looks like this, not on the projection onto the complex plane. Finally, let's go backwards. So square roots. So here, this time the function goes from the Riemann surface here to here. A cube function goes from here to here. The cube root function goes from here to here. So this time, this little locator here is going to pick a point on the complex plane. That vertical cyan line is all the points that would project down onto it. Um, on from the Riemann surface, when we try to visualize this as a complex uh, plane, and all those intersection points, when we un when we uh, when we unwind this Riemann surface back into the plane, it shows up as those three points that are equally spaced. Hopefully, you can hopefully this this intuition. Um, hopefully, you can see what I'm talking about, right? That's that's the most that's the most visceral part of this is seeing it. I can throw all the words I want at you, but the point is to see it. So um, you unwrap the complex plane into a spiral that wraps around itself three times. Then when you want to look at one point, you see where that all the points that project onto it from the Riemann surface. And then you can try to see, uh, try to visualize when you unwrap that Riemann surface back into the complex plane, you have these three equally spaced points on the left model. And just for fun, let's go to four. Great. And we see those are all the zeros evenly spaced. Awesome. Okay, and I didn't even start to talk about residues. Um, really, my motivation for all of this was I wanted to understand why residues are special. Um, this is a whole other thing. <laughs> so, um, right, uh, in, in short, the reason residues are special is because the log function is weird and the antiderivative of one over z is log and log is not analytic. Okay, well, wait, log is not analytic on the right domain that we need because uh, there's a branch cut. 
that's all complex analysis stuff. Okay, all right, so we talked about a lot today, covered a whole lot of ground. Um, like, like I'm sure you're already used to in this, co in this course, um, a lot of math is thrown at you, not all of it is relevant to you, but there's lots of cool ideas and maybe things that you'll tackle um, in a later course or just as, a, as an interest later. So um, again, I'll post these models on my website. Um, feel free to download them and play with them. Let me know if you find anything interesting, if you have an addition to make or something. Um, my email is asg498 at nyu.edu. And um, yeah, thanks for listening to uh, my lecture here. It's always fun to come back to visualization through Mathematica and uh, share some of the things I'm currently working on. And I'm so grateful to the current instructors for um, keeping the class alive and so grateful to you guys for, for taking the class. It means a lot that you would go out of your way to take a voluntary class like this, um, just you know, for the love of mathematics and visualizing things. So I hope you got a lot out of the semester um, and I hope you have a good finals week and a restful summer. Stay safe. And that is me signing off.